Shalom, welcome to our live webcast. It's Monday, October 21st, and you've just been listening to the wonderful music of Maurice Scalar off an incredible uh, CD that uh, we want to make available to you. It's called Hebrew Melodies, and uh, it's filled with some wonderful songs. Maurice is a true artist, and you can um, get more information and get the CD by going to his website. It's www.mauricescalar.com. Dot com. That's www.mauricescalar.com. Maurice is at many of our events around the world, and uh, we really enjoy his music. So he'll be back on a little bit later on in the program. Well, thanks for uh, for logging in tonight. We have a topic uh, that's of interest to many of you from all the RSVPs we received. T- tonight's topic is Middle East Conflict and Prophetic Fulfillments, Middle East conflict and prophetic fulfillments, that little tiny sliver of land called Israel, no bigger than the size of New Jersey, is the focus of world attention. And every day things are happening that are moving us closer to the last of the last days. Now we're going to try new technology tonight and bring into this conversation two uh, dear friends of mine. They're both experts on this topic. And let me introduce them to you. Welcome, guys. First, Walid Shubat, uh, a former Muslim terrorist and member of the PLO. Walid Shubat came to faith in Yeshua, Jesus, and now speaks out about the true dangers of radical Islam. His uh, book uh, has many books out. Uh, uh, they include Why I Left Jihad and God's War on Terror, and he's uh, perhaps uh, uh, the most comprehensive and detailed research uh, on this topic uh, is provided by my dear friend Walid. His most recent book, uh, which I really encourage you to get, is called A Case for Islam, uh, Islamophobia, Jihad by the Sword, America's Final Warning. So uh, we have that available. By the way, his website is www.shubat, just the way it sounds, shubat, S-H-O-E-B-A-T dot com. The Case for Islamophobia. Also joining us tonight over the Internet is Joel Richardson, a New York Times bestselling author. He's a recognized expert on Bible prophecy and the Middle East. Joel's been featured uh, on or written for distinguished TV and radio programs with Glenn Beck, Mike Huckabee, Sid Roth, Janet Parshall, uh, the New York Daily News, WND, and of course our own Jewish voice today, as well as many others. He's also written a number of books, including this one uh, that we've been offering on Jewish Voice called The uh, Mid-East Beast, A Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist, something both our guests agree on, an Islamic Antichrist. He also has a website I encourage you to check out, www, uh, Joel's Trumpet, joelstrumpet.com. Now, this is live. We're going to be taking your questions. There's three ways to reach us. First of all, you can call our toll-free number. It's 888-777-0782, 888-777-0782, or you can tweet us using hashtag JVWebcast. So we encourage you to call. You can click. You can tweet things that I don't even know how to do, but you can uh, email us. We want to hear from you. Many of us have written uh, us or emailed us with hundreds of questions already. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Jonathan. Wally, good good to see you. I love the microphone. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I hope you're doing well as well. I am. Thank you. Joel, how are you? Great to see you. I'm doing excellent. It's great to see you as well. Great. Well, we have lots and lots of questions that people have emailed to us, hundreds, in fact, the most we've ever received for a single webcast, and I think it's in large part due to the two of you being with us tonight. So thanks for taking the time to join us. You bet. Well, let's dig right in, and again, uh, we can be reached live, 888 easy number to call, 888 Email us, tweet us, and we'll try to get to your question. So, gentlemen, I'm going to throw out the first question to you. It's uh, concerning Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, where it talks about the three kings that fell. Do you think the three kings are Syria, Lebanon, or Egypt, leading to a formation of the king of the north? Wally, do you want to jump in on that first? Well, I'll let Joel jump in on it. Okay. Go ahead, Joel. Joel, take it away. 
uh, many of the early believers, when they looked at that three, they saw a direct correlation to Daniel 11, where it says the king of the north, who is the Antichrist, would first conquer Egypt, northern Sudan, which is Cush, as well as Libya or Put. Uh, that's a possibility. I think that is a, a very strong pong possibility in terms of identifying what that's speaking of in Daniel 7. I would have to agree because Daniel 11 clearly gives us the names of the nations. It says that he will enter Egypt, he will enter enter uh, Fut, which is Libya, and he will also enter Kush, which could be Sudan and Somaliland altogether. Now, we've seen recently when Erdogan of Turkey went to Egypt, was welcomed with open arms, went to uh, uh, Somalia, aided the Somalians with tons of monies in Sudan as well, and also entered into Libya with open arms. So this is a type uh, of fulfillment when it comes the influence of Turkey today in that region. That literally mimicked exactly what Daniel 11 was talking about. Now, it's Whether a, that's the fulfillment or not, uh, I, I, I'm still waiting. You, you guys, you know, I have, I have ma many guests on the program present different views, eschatological views. We listen to all of them. Uh, I, I believe there's good cases to be made for each. Interestingly, both of you believe that the Antichrist will come out of a revived Islamic empire as opposed to a revived Roman Empire, something that kind of goes against the grain of decades of teaching, of end-time teaching. Joel, talk about that. I think Walid and I together over the past several years have really set forth an overwhelming case, primarily first from the scriptures and then validated in terms of what's taking place in the earth. Um, so if we were to look at virtually any of the most significant Old Testament eschatological passage, the biggies, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, 11, Ezekiel 38, 39, Daniel 9, 26, they're all pointing to the Middle East. And again, probably the foundation for all of this is the understanding that the Bible is thoroughly Jerusalem, Israel, and Middle Eastern centric. That's the foundation for the whole this whole thing. This is a thoroughly Israel-centric eschatology. Now, if I may add, when we talk about revival of a Roman Empire, the bone of contention between me and Joel and others, or versus others, and that is, when they speak of a revival of a Roman Empire, they always think of the European Union. And sure, we can call it a revival of a Roman Empire, if you will, but which part of that empire? Uh, no one can refute that the Roman Empire included, included Turkey, which is the eastern province of the Roman Empire. And by the way, eastern Turkey, sorry, Turkey itself, became the Roman Empire after it fell in Rome. The barbarians uh, destroyed Rome and it continued in the in its full force in Byzantium. So that is a Roman Empire. How could you revive a Roman Empire without its eastern leg? Secondly, how could you revive a Roman Empire without North Africa? How can anyone disclude Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, and Mauritania, which, by the way, were part of the western leg of the Roman Empire? So when, it, when we talk about revival of a Roman Empire, we both agree, actually, there is a revival of a Roman Empire. But what constitutes this empire is where we differ. One side says it's the European Union, discluding Turkey, discluding North Africa, discluding the Middle East, by what right? In other words, mine and Joel's Roman Empire is really the Roman Empire. The other guys' Roman Empire includes Germany, which was never part of the Roman Empire, and is much smaller. Yeah, and how can people find out 
your positions by <laughs> lots of good materials available on this, by the way. Uh, Joel, question for you. When, when the Bible refers to the country to the north, is it referring to Russia? Now, this is where we look at Ezekiel 38:39. Now, Gog is the final invader, and he's from the land of Magog. Now, all of the teachers that are saying we should be looking to Russia, they're going to point to Josephus, who in the first century mentioned that Magog are the Scythian peoples. That may be true. Eventually, the Scythians migrated around the Black Sea into modern-day Russia. The problem is we don't care what Josephus uh, recognized as Magog. We care about what Ezekiel understood by the term Magog. We want to know what his immediate audience believed. And his very Old Testament literate Jewish audience would have very much been informed by the table of nations in Genesis 10. And so when we look at where the peoples were in the time of Ezekiel, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Tagorma, they're all in modern-day Turkey, not Russia. Now, if you want to use this bloodline lineage me method to try to identify the names, and you say, well, Magog is Russia, or you want to argue that Rosh is Russia, then you have to be consistent. And you have to say, who did Gomer become? Who did Meshach become? Gomer, for instance, became the Gimari, which became the Sumerians, which became the Celts and the Gauls. So if you want to argue that Russia is going to invade Israel, then you have to be consistent. You have to say, you know, the coming Irish invasion of Israel. You have to essentially include all of the Caucasian Japhetic world. You have to include Guatemala and New Zealand and Canada. Those, those type of scenarios don't sell well. Um, and so, you know, the whole Russian scenario, of course, does. But... We're not concerned with these sort of you know, bloodline, lineage, migration, tracing things all down through history. We're con concerned with original context. In the original context place, the overwhelming majority of the names in Ezekiel's prophecy in the nation of Turkey. Hmm. Well, you want to add to also, that? Also, if I may add, is it working? Uh, when we look at all the prophecy uh, teachers in the West, when they talk about Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38-39, they l rarely use real historians. And when they do use historians, I'll give you an example. They always quote Rawlinson. Rawlinson is a very formidable historian. And they say, they make the argument that Russia is Magog because Rawlinson talks about how they were the Scythians, so on and so forth. But if you look closely what Rawlinson says, he says that these people dwelt in the southern steppes of Russia, not Russia proper. So if you examine all the, scho all the scholars or biblical uh, teachers in the West, always look at the quotes by the historians, not by the theologian. In other words, the theologian must use proper history. Gog is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. You will never find any formidable historian that would tell you Meshech and Tubal is Moscow and Tobolsk. They all agree Meshech and Tubal is in Mushki and Tabalani, which is in Asia Minor, and that is Turkey. And the whole Magog is Turkey with the southern republics of Russia, which, by the way, are all Islamic. In fact, we should heed to what God says. God calls them fatlings of Bashan. Now, Bashan can never be Russia proper. Bashan is a Syrian region in the ancient days, which included parts of Turkey. Well, what's so interesting then, is yes. that what's so interesting is that just recently we've seen this scenario uh, taking place where the shift has been onto Turkey. It's just been in recent years. It's uh, it, Turkey was an ally of Israel, and that that relationship is is sadly uh, dissipating. Let, let me let me move to a question that we've been asked by many uh, 
since uh, we've announced this webcast, is war imminent in the Middle East? Is war imminent in the Middle East? And uh, if so, how soon? Somebody jump in on that. Is war imminent in the Middle East? What timetable are we looking at? I'll let is you take a, that one, Wally. Is it a lot? I didn't... War. Is war imminent in the Middle East? If so, how soon? I'm still not hearing. Is War. Israel is... War. Oh, war in the war. Middle East. Yes. If, when, how soon? Yes. Well, that's a good question because... It's a typical Western question. Westerners, when it comes to uh, tribulations and Armageddon, they always think about the war. But what they forget about is the peace or the false peace. We focus on the trends where Muslim fundamentalist movements are going on. We focus on the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda. We focus on the violence in Syria. But what we have to also focus on is that before all this comes about, is to focus on the peace process. Uh, what's happening in the Middle East right now is a lot of turmoil, so things going on in Syria. So we say, oh, is Damascus is about to be destroyed? So you see a lot of articles going around about, is this the fulfillment of Isaiah 17, uh, so on and so forth. But what we do have to wait is for the false peace treaty first. So it is, in essence, not the this flamboyant jihadi Islam that is going to usher forth this war in the beginning. It's going to be the secular, peaceful side of Islam that is going to give a facade of peaceful Islam, a model of Islam that's going to be acceptable by all entities, whether West or East. Currently, everyone is talking about the Turkish model of Islam. They want it in Egypt. They want it in North Africa. America loves it. So in essence, that's what we have to be looking at and what's, what's going to happen in the Middle East in the next few years first. So it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be a few years from now. Yeah, it, but, but everything's lining up. Joel, real quick, we have to take a break in just a minute. You want to weigh in on this? You know, the thing that is, is I think war is always imminent in the Middle East. But ultimately is the fulfillment of a specific uh, war in prophecy imminent. And I would agree with Waleed, the next significant prophetic event is the false peace covenant. And so that's what we should be looking at. Anything beyond that really is, is speculation. And of course, you know, ultimately no one knows the future. I mean, there's many things that we could be looking at that could be leading to war any time, and we should be prepared for that. But um, from a prophetic perspective, we're looking to the, the false peace treaty. Yeah, we have a lot more questions coming up. Uh, guys, so be on standby. We'd love to hear from you live, 888-777-0782. It's a free call. You can also tweet us using hashtag JV website. Uh, we have a very, very exciting outreach that we're uh, launching uh, as a second phase, and it's our Miracle of Israel television special. This is a, a documentary that's narrated by Leonard Nimoy that uh, we have produced and will be airing around the country beginning in early November. And you can see on your screen a list of the different cities that will be airing. We're also making this available to you uh, for a gift. The information uh, is on your screen. The Miracle of Israel. We've redone this. Uh, it's been re-edited. We've put some new material in. Uh, we have some never-before-seen material, and we're making it available to you. Uh, first release of the revised Miracle of Israel, a documentary uh, that's received many awards already. Uh, Waleed's in it and uh, many other friends. Uh, Israel is a miracle. And if God has been fulfilling what he promised thousands of years ago, in connection with the reestablishment of the state of Israel, bringing the Jewish people back to the land, he's preserved them supernaturally, then he's also going to fulfill what he promises will happen in the future. So we want to make that available to you. Again, the information's on your screen. The miracle of Israel. Take about three to six weeks to get it to you because it's just coming off of the uh, production line. The newly revised miracle of Israel and in a couple of weeks, you can go to MiracleOfIsrael.com and see the different uh, places that it will be airing in November and December. We'll be in Detroit. 
We'll be in Denver. It'll be in Boston. It'll be in San Diego, just to mention a few, all around the United States. And uh, hopefully it'll come to your city, if not this November, December, sometime in 2014. Uh, okay. Lots more ahead. 888-777-0782. 888 We have a caller, uh, Ed from Florida. Ed, go ahead. Uh, hello there. Hey. Um, I'd like to say just on the front end that my wife was in uh, uh, the Ukraine uh, with you in 19, uh, about uh, 2004, something like that, and a great outreach. It was tremendous, tremendous. Changed your life. Wonderful. Um, anyway. Uh, the question is, Psalm 83, uh, do you think that that's already happened, any, any attack from the six nations around uh, Israel and the, the defeat of uh, these nations, or do you think that's something that's coming up in the future? Gentlemen, Psalm 83 has made it onto the scene. Are you able to hear the question coming in? Yes, Psalm I heard it. The, the, the problem with Psalm 83, Psalm 83 is that many Western students of Bible prophecy isolate Psalm 83 by itself. You can't. You've got to look at Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all kingdoms, all nations. The only one who arises from the throne to judge the nations is the Messiah. So it's definitely a messianic prophecy in which the Messiah comes again on earth. Uh, so when we look at the context as well, those nations, they're all Islamic. The reason they separate this from Armageddon is because they are Islamic nations. It doesn't involve European countries. So they say it must be separate, but we can't separate it that easily because it says, do to them as you did to Zeb and Zalmunna, the Midianites. Well, this really pertains to when Gideon destroyed Midianites and killed Zeb and Zalmunna and took the crescent moon and crushed it down to the earth. In other words, it's really the destruction of the crescent. That crescent, by the way, is all over the Bible. It's in Revelation chapter 12. The moon under her feet, trying to destroy Israel and the church, and it's the red dragon, you know. Uh, you know, We have this also in Isaiah 45, 46. Bell bows, Nebo stoops. Bell is the moon god. Bows, it will be destroyed. There's many areas in the Bible that's focusing on the symbol of Islam and the destruction, utterly destruction, of an Islamic invasion against Israel. So we can't divorce it. And if I hey, could uh, add to that. Joel, please do. Yeah, there's um, a significant, very popular perspective regarding Psalm 83 right now, which says that this is a specific war which is imminent. And so according to those that are teaching this theory, you have a nation of six million Jews, the nation of Israel, which is about to literally annihilate, destroy, and occupy several nations which surround Israel, which have about 200 million Arabs. And so we're led to believe that this is reasonable, that 6 million Jews are going to occupy 200 million Arabs, or destroy them, or annihilate them, and actually commit perhaps the greatest genocide in recent, I mean, in all of world history. Now, the way that we can demonstrate that this completely unbiblical, that this is not a war that's about to happen, is by walking through all of the various names in the psalm, and then looking at other prophetic passages which describe the Messiah specifically judging those nations. So for instance, the primary or the first name in Psalm 83 is Edom. Well, we can look at Numbers 24, where you have the prophecy of Balaam, who describes the Messiah. You know, a star will rise from Jacob, a scepter from Israel. And what does the Messiah do? He will crush the foreheads of Moab. He will destroy Edom. So it's the Messiah himself who will carry this out when he returns at the Battle of Armageddon. We could look at Isaiah 25, where the Lord himself is crushing Moab. We could look at the book of Obadiah, where the Lord is judging Edom in the context of the kingdom being established. Numerous, numerous prophecies, I mean, probably at least a dozen, where all of the names listed in Psalm 83 are specifically destroyed in the context of the presence of the Messiah. So what the popular Psalm 83 theory does 
script is it takes the victory of Jesus and it tries to move it back several years and give it to the Israeli defense forces. And, um, you know, I, I think the folks that are looking at this are well-intentioned, but I, I just don't believe that it lines up with uh, the rest of the prophets. In, in, in fact, in fact, the destruction of Edom, adding to what Brother Joel said, the destruction of Edom is mentioned also in Ezekiel 25. God says, I will stretch out my arm against Edom. God's arm, from a messianic perspective, is always the Messiah. God will send the Messiah to destroy Edom. Yet where is this Edom? In Ezekiel 25, it stems from Timan to Edan. That will be the heart of Saudi Arabia, the Arab world. And who comes out of Edom with his garments sprinkled with blood? Who can deny it's the Messiah? So the very nations that are in Psalm 83 involve all the other prophecies about the Messiah fighting. And by the way, in every one of those prophecies where the Messiah fights, nations that are in Psalm 83 exist. He fights them personally himself. So while we, th we always study how the Messiah lands on the Mount of Olives, we don't study who the nations the Messiah fights. Every single nation the Messiah fights in the Bible, every one of them are Islamic. Not one of them is European. Mm. Thank you. 888 uh, mm. Ed, thanks for your call. 888 uh, Hey, some interesting things in the, uh, in the news that I wanted to make you aware of in just the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, very interesting for us. Many of you support our outreaches to the Lost Tribes of Israel. We uh, are working in places like Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and another place that we've been working in since 2010 is Manipur, India. Well, recently the government of Israel approved new aliyah, or new immigration for Indian lost Jews. The Israeli cabinet has voted to allow nearly 900 lost Jews from India to make aliyah to Israel in the upcoming months. The new immigrants are members of the B'nai Menashe, a group of Indian citizens who trace their roots to the Jewish tribe of Menashe, one of the ten lost tribes exiled by the Assyrian regime over 2,700 years ago. Hundreds of the B'nai Menashe are already living in Israel uh, and have made Aliyah, but they are now allowing another 900 to come to Israel, fulfilling many Bible prophecies such as Deuteronomy chapter 30, that says, when you obey my statutes, I will gather you from the nations that you were scattered to. Uh, one of my favorites is from uh, the book of Jeremiah, where we're told that the Lord would bring back the captives of Zion. Isaiah talks about the outcasts of Israel coming back to the land, and we're seeing it happening now before our very eyes. It's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and many of you have been part of that through our outreaches to these different uh, groups like the B'nai Menashe. Uh, Jerusalem Post uh, from uh, October 7th, Israel slams UN decision to allow Iran. This is ridiculous. Guys, you may want to comment on this. Uh, the decision to allow Iran to join the WMD watchdog. I think this is absurd. Israel on... Um, this is from uh, the 7th, condemn the selection of Iran to serve, get this, on the U.N. General Assembly's Committee for Disarmament and International Security. That's idiotic. You, you, did you, you both hear about this? Iran no. being invited to serve on the U.N. General Assembly Committee for Disarmament and International Security. Well, it tells us about the United Nations. It sure does. Israeli I mean, ambassador to the, the UN. The Bible has always been anti-United Nations. That goes back to Babel. You know, I mean, Iran is building nuclear weapons to destroy Israel. It attempts to destroy Israel. I mean, to but, <laughs> it's, you got to laugh. It's it's almost uh, humorous that the UN invites Iran to serve on the Committee for Disarmament and International Security. Joel, what do you say about that? You know, I mean, one of the most significant signs of the times is the fact that, unlike during the Holocaust, you now have the Jews in the land, but right now you have the explosion of a global anti-Semitism. And it's not just among the most radical Islamic nations. 
an act like this is a direct it's not just a poke in the eye of Israel it's a it's a direct provocation I mean they're they're going to be as insulting as possible and it's it's just beyond disgusting. you know who they be, they probably beat out North Korea who may be asked next ridiculous Netanyahu which, which by the way uh, Jonathan this is going to allow Iran to build its nuclear weapons. The, recogni the recognition of Iran by the United Nations will allow Iran to have its nuclear weapons. And I've always argued that Iran will get away with it. I was right the whole time. Yeah, you were. But where those weapons will land, it's not going to be on Israel. It's going to be on Saudi Arabia. And we're watching. I've heard you say that for a long time. We'll wait and see. By the way, many of you saw uh, Pr uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu speak in the UN. He did a fantastic job. Called uh, Rouhani a wolf in sheep's clothing, addressing the UN General Assembly. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Rouhani is a wolf in sheep's clothing, where he said that Ahmadinejad was a wolf in wolf's clothing. We're now dealing with a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, he's fully committed to the, pro the nuclear program, yet he claimed that he wants to fully dismantle Iran's nuclear weapon program, an absolute lie. Waleed, you've talked about this before. They say one thing that's translated into English, but they're saying something completely different in Arabic or Persian or whatever Correct. native language. Correct. It, we talk about taqiyya. Many heard the term taqiyya. They say, well, taqiyya is... Uh, Islam permits Muslims to lie in cases of war, propaganda, things of that sort. But the Muslim apologists will argue and say, wait a minute, taqiyya is really a Shiite principle, not a Sunni principle. Well, they're right. But what West doesn't understand is that the Sunnis have a similar principle called Muruna. M-U-R-U-N-A. Everybody should Google this with my name, Shuba. And they will say how they will see how I was first began to show the Muslim Brotherhood's expounding with tons of material on how to exercise Muruna in the West, how to be stealth, how to use banking system, how to even allow marriage between a Muslim girl and a Jew. In the case of Huma Abedin and Antony Weiner, her mother was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. How is the marriage of a Muslim woman and a Jew? It doesn't square. Well, there you go. Muruna, how to be stealth. It is permissible in the Sunni sect of Islam to exercise Muruna, and they're doing it all the way all from the government, uh, from the education system in the U.S., uh, from buying charter schools and converting them to madrasas uh, by the Turks, uh, from having assistance to President Obama. Uh, uh, like Rashad Hussein, uh, all of this is in full operation by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Wahhabist in the West. We can look at Saudi Manifesto, which Huma Abedin's father constructed with the Saudi government. I was the first in the country to translate excerpts of this manifesto to use the Muslim minorities in the West to take over the host nations that hosts them which is the rest of the world. Well, here's another example of that from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, Iran's nuclear program hangs over its own head. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was interviewed by the British Broadcasting Corporation's Persian service, uh, making the first ever interview with Persian media, media by an Israeli prime minister. Uh, Netanyahu displayed a book uh, by uh, Rouhani, which proved that he took steps in the past to mislead the West into allowing the Tehran government to continue its military uh, nuclear development program. Uh, we, he's saying one thing in one language. We don't listen to what they say in English, but in their own uh, language. Hey, one other piece of information on, uh, unrelated to that. A Pew survey that just came out, very interesting. Boundaries blur between Jews and Christian in shocking ways. Really interesting facts. Uh, here, here's, here's one fact. 34% of Jews say they think that being Jewish is compatible with believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Huge breakthrough for ministries like ours that are telling the Jew first that Jesus is the Messiah. 34% of Jews today in America believe that and think that it's compatible 
with believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. That is remarkable. And then uh, 1.2 million non-Jewish Americans identify as sort of Jewish, even though they are not Jewish by religion and have no Jewish family background. Things are changing. As Dylan sang, the times, they are a-changing. Amazing, amazing Pew report. Hey, we have another caller. Asa is calling from Georgia. Asa, thanks for your patience. Are you there? Oh, yes, sir, I am. Thank you for taking my call. Well, welcome. What's your question? Okay, it's a two-part question. Me and my brothers discussed this several times and would like to get y'all's uh, insight on it. The uh, the two main wars, uh, which I think is obviously the Battle of Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon, could this be the same uh, battle? And secondly, uh, we're just curious where the um, seven years it's described that Israel will be burning the weapons from that war uh, where where does that, in y'all's opinion, fall into the prophetic timeline, and how close do you think we might be to seeing that fulfilled? Okay, Joel, you want to start on that one? Sure. Let me begin with the seven years. You have a lot of people that say that during the millennium it would be impossible for the Jewish people to be burning their weapons. I don't understand why. Uh, for instance, in the prophets, it says that during the millennium they'll be beating their swords into plowshares. This is a very similar picture. They're using uh, weapons of war for agricultural purposes or for fuel and whatnot. Uh, throughout the prophets, it says that under the leadership of Yeshua, under the leadership of Jesus, we'll be rebuilding the earth, rebuilding the ruins. And so I have no problem with saying that they'll be burning their weapons into the millennium. It's just like beating the swords into plowshares. The battle of Gog of Magog, of Ezekiel 38-39, it's a very broad prophecy. It begins on one end with the Lord placing the thought into the mind of Gog to invade a land of unwalled villages to a, peace, a people a peaceful, unsuspecting, in the, living in the center of the earth. It concludes with the Lord on the ground, in the land, with the nations acknowledging that he is the Holy One in Israel. Kadosh, Kadosh, Bah Yisrael. You have this phrase, the Holy One of Israel, Kadosh, Kadosh, Yisrael, used roughly 25 times throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. Only once in all of the Hebrew Scriptures is the phrase, the Holy One in Israel used, and it's used at the conclusion of Ezekiel 38-39. Ezekiel 38-39 is the, the parousia of the Old Testament. It is the return of Jesus of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Yeah, we're we're going to have to keep... Waleed, I want to hear from you too, but we have lots of callers waiting. Matt from Mississippi. Uh, Matt, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Can you hear me? I can. What's your question? All right, thank you, thank you so much for taking my call. Just very briefly, I read an article last year by um, uh, Joel when speaking to Prime Minister Erdogan and Mohammed in Turkey and Mohammed Mercy in Egypt that we could be seeing the rise of the King of the North and the King of the South. But he was not saying it was them, but he was just saying this could be the beginnings of the rise. So my question is, is did they see the Muslim Brotherhood falling from power? Um, because I know there was a, a lot of talk about well, now the Muslim Brotherhood is taking over Egypt. Did, does the Bible, in a sense, if we truly are at the end here, at the end, in the last days, do they see the Muslim Brotherhood falling from power? And is that why Turkey will one day invade? Uh, to kind of take back what the Muslim Brotherhood has lost. That may, may not be a very good question, but uh, um, I don't know if they understand what I'm asking. Sure, sure. Real briefly, let me just say this. I didn't see the Muslim Brotherhood falling. Of course, we don't see everything. I sure. thought that what we would see is two Islamist nations competing for regional dominance that there would be a conflict of interest for leadership. 
but now that the Brotherhood has fallen and you have this secular uh, or, or a, a more just military run government, now the antagonism between Turkey and Egypt is far more clear. So actually it's fallen into place in, in a much more significant uh, biblical alignment for the potential between military action between Turkey and Egypt. And even General Sisi has been just mocking Erdogan, referring to him as Sultan Erdogan, and saying that they're going to sign the uh, statement referring to the Armenian genocide of Turkey. So the tension there has just grown since the Second Revolution mm -hmm. uh, in a way far more than I could have foreseen. Let's put in the equation also Isaiah 19. Isaiah 19 speaks literally of a civil war in Egypt in which city will go against city, neighborhood against neighborhood, brother against brother. In fact, the context of Isaiah 19 is that the Lord, the Messiah himself, will come riding in the clouds and enters into Egypt. Why? He goes to defend the believers in Egypt. They will cry to the Lord to send them a savior. So when we see the civil war in Egypt, it's very crucial. We see it already. There is a schism in Egypt in which we see the riotings and the fighting exactly as Isaiah 19 prescribed it. Neighborhood versus neighborhood. So this collapse of Egypt eventually will allow an entry of another Islamic government to keep the peace, which will be in this case Turkey. Again, hey, we just got a, a, a tweet on Twitter from Nicole. Any biblical connection, to, you might want to comment on the way this is phrased, to Israeli settlements on Palestinian land. Walid. Israeli settlements in, in Palestinian land. How could somebody claim that Italians can settle in Italy? Americans can settle in America. Israelis settle on Israel. That is Judea, number one. Number two, you look at all the villages there, even you look at the Palestinian villages, what they call these different names. There is no existence really of Ramallah. Ramallah was called Ramalia by the Crusades. Beit Lahem, is not Beit Lachmu, as many uh, Palestinian apologists make it. It's Bethlehem, the house of bread. Even my village in the district of Bethlehem, Beit Sahur, it's really a Hebraic name. All the names are Hebraic. These settlers that we call settlers are simply reclaiming areas that were biblically, historically Jewish, with the names are Jewish. And they say, we want to resettle in those lands. Now, the question people don't ask is, what about Palestinians who settle in Israel proper? What about the Bedouin problem? They settle wherever they want in Israel, and no one talks about the Arab settlements in Israel proper, but we seem to all be talking about Jewish settlements in Judea. My question to everyone is, Judea belongs to Jews. Judea, Jews, it makes sense. Yeah, Nicole, I, I think this, we talk a lot about this on Jewish Voice. The issue is not God loving one people more than another. It's what does he what does he say in his word about this land? And as Bible believers, we either choose to believe that or not to believe it. And the Bible's very clear. I will give this land to you as an everlasting possession through your children, Isaac and Jacob. It's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The land was given to them as a an everlasting land grant from the Lord Himself. That that's what the Bible says, clear and simple. And we either choose to believe what the Scriptures say or not. Uh, does God love the Palestinian people? Absolutely. Does He have a peace plan for Palestinian and Israeli? Absolutely. It's the Prince of Peace. But we believe that very strongly. Terry from Ohio, are you there? Terry. Are you yeah. still with Hi. us? Thanks for your patience. Um, wonderful. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay. A wonderful conference tonight, by the way. Um, Thank backing you. Backing up to question before about the war in the Middle East, um, it was said that there would be probable peace uh, agreement first. And the way I understand Daniel's prophecy, um, that would start the seven-year tribulation. Uh, would that be how... You view it? Joel, is that what you see? It begins the final seven years. The first three and a half years of that seven-year period are 
uh, not nearly as uh, filled with war and, and destruction and catastrophe as the second half. Right. Wally, do you see it the same way? Yes, it uh, must commence in Egypt. They go to Egypt, they make a covenant in Egypt, which God will make null and void. We look today, what is the issues in the Middle East? It is Egypt, Syria, you know. So we see that Egypt is a focal point. What is the arguments about Israel peace process? It's about Camp David Accords. Are we going to reestablish the Camp David, reconfirm? In fact, the Antichrist confirms a covenant. He doesn't establish a peace treaty. He confirms a covenant that is already in existence. So we don't have to come up with any new peace treaties. It is a okay. existing peace treaty. Currently, this peace treaty will be honored uh, under the current Egyptian government. Uh, but who's going to ensure it? It's going to be also the Antichrist, in which it will be signed in Egypt. So we focus on Egypt when it comes to the peace treaty. Key player, we have another called Todd from Thank Georgia. You. Thank you for calling. Todd, are you there? Todd from Georgia. Lots of calls tonight. Thank you for your patience. Todd, are you there? Okay, 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 okay. Uh, he's got to turn his speakers on. <laughs> okay. Who's... Sorry. Todd, is that you? We still have you? Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, great. Well, thanks for hanging in there. We hear you now. Um, yeah, um, my question for, was for Wall Lead. And uh, it was, um, he talks about the 12th Imam before, and I wondered if anybody's come forward yet that fits that description. Well, I, I don't discuss the 12th Imam predominantly as the 12th Imam. The 12th Imam is a uh, idea that is by the Shia. What we and Joel talk about is the Mahdi period. Sure, there is the idea of 12 Imam by the Hujjatia, and that is the Iranian revolutionary movement. But really, the essence of an ima of a Mahdi who comes from the Sunni world, uh, you, the, the majority of the Muslim world is Sunni. The Sunni will not accept the 12th Imam. So I would focus on the Mahdi. As me and Joel have argued in the past, the OIC, Organization of Islamic Conference, have declared that all Muslims must believe in the Mahdi. He will come when there is trouble in the world. Right now we see trouble in Syria, we see trouble in Egypt. This is a perfect time for the Islamists to come up with a Mahdi. So he will establish seven-year covenant. This is what we learned when I was Muslim. The Mahdi will establish a seven-year covenant. He will establish a covenant with Israel. He will also set up his headquarters in Israel on the Temple Mount. He will deal with the children of Aron as well. And I'm sure Joe would love to add to this. Yeah, you know, there was a poll done last year by the Pew Research firm. We lost him, huh? Okay. Is that... We're going to try to get them back... Uh, for technical difficulties. This is the first time we've tried to take the stand. So uh, we'll get them back up and continue. Janice, are you on the line? Janice from West Virginia. Janice, are you there? How about Frank from Texas? We have a lot of calls tonight. I think it's yeah, short. Frank, I'm here. Hi, Frank. I think we're shorting out our uh, control booth back there with everything. But uh, what's your question? I don't know if we'll get Joel back on in time or Waleed, but I'll sure take a stab at it. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, the, my question is, yeah, there, there is in America this view that uh, there is, we are the final Babylon. We're the daughter of Tarsus, according to uh, several authors in America, and that uh, the Masonic Illuminati trying to bring in an Antichrist, the New World Order. Yeah, so your question is America possibly the uh, yeah. the final, the place the Antichrist actually emerges from?
Frankie there? Exactly. And then secondary, if, uh, what is, uh, what's the relationship of now the, the view of the Islamic Antichrist? There is a relationship. It will, will there be an interaction? Or how the, the our, our panelists view this view here in America, according to Masonic Illuminati Antichrist and the Muslim Antichrist? Well, when we get them back on, I'll bring up that, uh, I'll restate that question to them. Most Bible scholars do not see a prominent place for America in last day's Bible prophecy, and I've read very, very little that connects the Antichrist to America. The scenario, the end-time scenario, the end-time map is really centered on the Middle East, and uh, the, the predominant view is one of two, that either a revived Roman Empire will provide the uh, the an antichrist, a final uh, ruler who will first come in peace and then turn, or the Islamic nations. Both of our guests tonight uh, strongly believe that uh, the antichrist will come from a revived Islamic empire, but very, very little um, is said about America. There's places where you can extrapolate out that you can possibly see America. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, a, a strong nation that has sent forth ambassadors uh, but you, there's really not a predominant view out there among Bible te- end-time Bible teachers that the U.S. will play a, a predominant role, that the focus is turning back to the Middle East. Uh, Janice from West Virginia, are you on with us? Janice from West Virginia. Okay, well, we're still having some technical difficulties. Thanks for uh, bearing with us. Uh, a number of other questions that came in. Uh, somebody wrote to us and asked, what does the Bible say uh, uh, about when the thousand-year reign becomes uh, begins? Is it after the rapture? The thousand-year reign is a uh, six verses from Revelation chapter 20 that talk about the uh, Messiah reigning out of Jerusalem which will begin upon the Messiah's return to this earth. We're told in Zechariah that he, that he comes back to the Mount of Olives, a physical Jerusalem, which is why Jerusalem has to be restored into Jewish hands. It's clearly uh, the, um, the restored Jerusalem with Jewish people that cries out, Blessed is you, comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, the Messiah returns uh, in victory, destroys his enemies, and begins a millennial reign actually in the t- at the Temple Mount in physical Jerusalem, and he reigns there for a thousand years. That's the idea of the millennium coming from 1,000, whether it's a literal thousand years or not. I'm not going to comment, but it's the, a physical reign of the Messiah on this earth, a time of peace and prosperity. Janice, do we have you back from West Virginia? Yes, I'm here. Can oh, I'm me? glad. Yeah, how are you? Oh, fine, thanks. If I, I... It seemed like he's talking to me before and nobody can hear me. I could not hear uh, I had a question. He meant that the next event we should be looking for is uh, the the peace treaty that the Antichrist is going to make. But uh, how can that... Can Christians really still be here at that time? Won't they be raptured before that? Well, that's a very good question, and I think that both of our guests who are now on... Gentlemen, I don't know if you heard the question uh, from Janice... But she's asking about the uh, the peace treaty. Joel, I have your thumbs up. Wally, can you hear as well? Yes. Did you? Sorry, we lost. Did you hear the question? What about the peace treaty? Uh, whether Christians should be looking for that, or whether this will be after the rapture, so it's not something that will be oh, here for. A, now you get into the pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture, post-trib yes. rapture, and God forbid you have a position on the rapture. It's a Western argument. And it behooves me why so many people are so focused uh, on the timing of the rapture instead of being prepared to be with the Lord. In other words, we need to get our acts in gear. Are we getting involved in helping our brethren in Egypt, in Syria, in the Philippines? Do you know there's armed struggle in many Christian nations that are fighting against the Islamists? Are we helping the Copts in Egypt? Are we helping the suffering persecuted Christians in Pakistan? Or are we sitting together, arguing, 
are we going to be bailing out before or in the middle or at the end? Well put. Uh, Joel, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I would say this. Today the church celebrates men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and uh, people like the Cory Ten Boom family. Um, and we judge the German church for their failure to be believers during the Holocaust. Right now we have anti-Semitic rhetoric throughout the earth on a level that is hundred times worse than anything that we saw before World War II and the Holocaust. Um, and, you know, there were things being said behind closed doors, but what is being said now is open from multiple, multiple sources, far worse. And we have to say, what was the theology that caused the German church to fail? What, is the, what are the theologies that are causing us to do nothing right now in light of what is obviously on the horizon? The scriptures are clear that the time of Jacob's trouble is coming, and most of the church is doing nothing to prepare for it. I would argue, I would argue largely because of the idea that we're all just going to be out of here. And I think it's an incredibly dangerous thing to believe that we are not going to stand with the Jewish people in the time of their suffering. If we want to be grafted into their glory, then I think we should be prepared to be grafted into their suffering as well. And I'm going to prepare my life and my family for that. And if I get raptured out before that, wonderful. But I don't personally believe the scriptures teach that. Joel, thank Keep you very much. Matthew 25. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison, you visited me. Now, who is Jesus talking about? The people who are proactive and active in helping persecuted Jews and the Christian church and the suffering. That's why I like what you're doing, Brother Jonathan. You know, you are an active person who is really going out there and doing physical help for the Jewish people. You know, this is what we need to do, focus on these issues. It's an action kind of ministry. Our ministry isn't just talking prophecy. Our ministry is to prepare and work as we teach about those issues. Thank you both so much. This ends our um, the time we have to continue to take questions. Uh, Walid's newest book, uh, The Case for Islamophobia, Jihad by the Swords, America's Final Warning. I really encourage you to get this book. You can... Uh, uh, get more information by going to his website. It's www.shubat.com, uh, S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. Joel's current book also, Mid-East Beast, a scriptural case for Islamic an Islamic Antichrist, New York Times bestselling author Joel Richardson, uh, www.joelstrumpet.com. Gentlemen, thank you both for being on the webcast tonight. Keep up the good work, and we'll look forward to having you back on the program. Uh, at a later time. We've just run out of time. There's so much tonight that we didn't get a chance to cover. Hundreds of questions uh, that came in from from you. This uh, is such an important topic. We didn't get a chance to talk about the four blood moons in 2014 and 2015. Uh, John Hagee's just written a book that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, Is this a sign of the last days? So we'll have to come back and talk about the blood moons and what that all means. Uh, Lots of questions about the uh, Jews of Ethiopia uh, returning to Israel and other places. We didn't get to talk about that. We didn't talk about questions relating to the Jewish calendar and whether these drive end-time events in 5774 and 5775. We have to come back and talk about that. Uh, We haven't uh, talked much about um, uh, the... um, return of the Jewish people back to their God. We had many questions about a revival among Jewish people. So many things that we still need to talk about. The rebuilding of the temple. Is the red heifer been found or properly bred, and is the temple in process of being rebuilt? These are some of the questions we just weren't able to get to tonight, and uh, we'll come back at a later broadcast and tackle some of these. Um, We take time in every webcast to pray for the needs that have come to us, and we want to take a few moments to do that right now. Many of you have written us with prayer requests. Nicole from California has asked uh, for God's will in her life and her husband's wife. Colleen from Florida has asked for financial help. Uh, uh, Lucinda from Colorado uh, needs employment 
and we're going to be praying for you. Lucinda Susan from uh, San Antonio is also praying for employment, financial breakthroughs. Florence has asked for a financial breakthrough. Uh, uh, Jenny from California, her husband has colon cancer. We want to lift up uh, that need. Uh, Suzanne, uh, whose husband lost her job and uh, they're working through savings and now she's fighting breast cancer. Uh, Mary Jo's asked for prayer for uh, an MRI that she's having tomorrow. Uh, many, many prayers for healing, for miracles, for healing, for marriage. I want you to know that God hears your prayers. He knows your need even before you have need of them. And we'll be praying for these prayer requests through the week. We have a prayer coordinator here at Jewish Voice. And we take your uh, your needs very, very seriously. But God does, and that's even more important. So whatever your need is tonight, I want to just agree with you in the name of Yeshua. There's a name. It's a name above every name. And it's the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that by his stripes we are healed. He's making intercession for you, sitting at the right hand of the Father even now. And I want you to know we care about you, but God cares even more. So if you'll just join with me in prayer, we're going to take these prayer requests before the throne. I know we're a little bit over. Thanks for watching tonight. We appreciate your patience through all of our technical difficulties. Um, But we're we're sure glad you're with us tonight. We'll try to cover at least part of this again on our next broadcast along with uh, Hanukkah. Uh, We want to talk about the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, So much more that we'll talk about in these upcoming webcasts. Uh, we're committed to doing these, and we hope that you'll continue to join us. Let's let's go ahead and pray now and uh, bring these prayer requests before the Lord. Father, in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're the God who hears and answers prayer. And for those that have financial needs, for those that have asked for prayer for employment, for those that have asked for help to pay for their home, We thank you that you're the God who hears and answers prayer and provides for our every need according to your riches and glory in the Messiah. Lord, for family needs, for the restoration of marriages and children, we thank you that you're the God who restores and we declare salvation for households even now. For those who need healing by the stripes of Yeshua, you are healed. We we command breast cancer, colon cancer, bone marrow cancer to go. In the name of Yeshua, we speak life, life, life. We speak healing, wholeness, and health in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name. And we thank you that it's done. It's done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thanks for watching watching us tonight. Uh, we have a, a live webcast in November, and uh, we'll have those dates for you on Facebook and uh, you'll be able to uh, log on to our website and see those dates as well. Thanks for watching tonight. Until next month, uh, shalom and God bless you.